Okay, welcome everyone. I'm Blake Tedder, the Communications and Engagement Coordinator with the Duke Forest Teaching and Research Laboratory at Duke University. This is the first video in a new series from the Office of the Duke Forest called Ask a Scientist. Uh, our goal is to engage our community with science and introduce all of you to some of our researchers. Uh, the questions we ask our guests are for non-scientists submitted by you, non-scientists via social media and other means, uh, and asked by me, a true non-scientist. Um, we hope you learn something new. Find out more about the Duke Forest after this interview at dukeforest.duke.edu or by signing up for our newsletter or following us on social media. Our Instagram account's really great, just gotta tell you. Uh, we are really excited today to be talking with uh, Dr. Steve Kummer, who is uh, the William H. Younger Distinguished Professor of Engineering at Duke University's Pratt School of Engineering. Dr. Kummer received his PhD in electrical engineering from Stanford University in 1997, and prior to joining Duke in 1999, he spent two years at NASA's Goddard uh, Space Flight Center as a National Research Council postdoctoral research associate. Awards he has received include National Science Foundation's uh, Award, uh, Foundation Career Award and a Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers in 2001. His current work is in a variety of theoretical and experimental electromagnetic problems related to geophysical remote sensing and engineered electromagnetic materials. Steve, your work is literally over my head um, so I'm hoping you can bring it down to earth with, uh, with this little interview. Thanks for being Thanks, on. Blake. Uh, I will do my best. Yeah, great. Well, what we want to do in this series is ask uh, some, some basic questions first about what you do, uh, and then uh, uh, hit you with a, a barrage of questions from, from people in our community that are interested in your work. So uh, the first question we'd like to ask is, what do you study generally? and what's exciting about it uh, to you? Yeah, so um, the common thread to all the research that uh, I do at Duke is the, is the propagation of waves. Um, I love how waves are connected to, to so many different things, sound and light and radio, uh, all of these things fundamentally, sort of at a physical level, are, are waves and there's some commonalities about how all those things behave. Um, you know, and I cling to this thing that I learned uh, while a graduate student in a class that I took that was on just waves in general and those common aspects that, that made the point that the, the one and only one way that nature has to transmit information or energy from one point to another without actually sending any mass or physical stuff from one point to another is with waves, light, sound, radio waves. Um, and it turns out that uh, among other things, using waves, radio waves and light uh, is a really good way to study lightning. And so that's been a common thread for my research since my graduate school days. Okay, and by any chance are you a surfer? Um, I have surfed, um, but I would by no means call myself a surfer. It, uh, it's fun, but it's kind of hard. You could probably get right in the middle of a wave and just and have some insight. <laughs> and commune with it, exactly. If I could ever get right in the middle of the wave, the hard part is getting on it. Okay, so you study waves in, in essence, and you study what waves can uh, tell you about something like lightning? Or does, right. is lightning a wave? Um, with lightning's not a wave by itself, but lightning and all the different processes that happen inside lightning, they emit tons of waves. The sound waves from thunder, radio waves, light waves, all of those things. And, uh, and it's those waves that give you some insight into what is, what's actually happening inside a lightning flash. And that's sort of what our group does. Cool. And, and so the, the next question is, and this is a big one, so um, if you could boil it down, how do you study uh, waves coming off of lightning? Right. So it's, it's radio waves that uh, are sort of the core component of my group's lightning research. Um, and not surprisingly, what that means is we have 
a lot of different radio wave sensors, like antennas that cover different, uh, different frequencies of signals that are emitted by lightning. Um, and we have those sensors deployed in uh, a lot of them in the Duke Forest, um, but there's more than a dozen of them actually spread around the world in different places where lightning happens. And what we do is we basically sit there and listen using those sensors to the, uh, to the radio emissions that come from lightning and then use that as our sort of main research tool to either do things like uh, to actually use those radio signals to make a picture of lightning oh, cool. uh, or sometimes just to detect whether something did or did not happen in a particular lightning flash. Cool. And what does a, I'm going off script here, what does a lightning uh, bolt sound like in radio waves? Can you give your best impression? <laughs> <Just> <laughs> 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 Thankfully for you and everybody else, I cannot give my impression. And one of the reasons is that like, you know, if you, if you kind of map what you know about sound, you know, sound that you can hear comes in different frequencies. There's low notes and it gets higher and higher. And then you can go to frequencies that are beyond what you can hear, where dogs can hear. And then you enter into ultrasound where you can use sound waves for imaging inside the body, but it's nothing you can see. It's the same with the radio waves, like really low frequencies to very, very, very high frequencies. And all of those different signals and energy gives you different information about what's happening. Neat. I'm fascinated that uh, light and electricity can be turned into sound, which can be turned into some kind of spatial model that you create. So I'm curious about what your setup is in the forest generally, for example, or any of your other sites? What, what are you working with? What's your ar array of antenna look like? Right, so in our Duke Forest site where we've got a, a trailer, a room and a trailer adjacent to an empty field, um, the sensors themselves are outside the trailer, um, close to the middle of the field. Um, and sometimes, some, depending on the signals that we're receiving, some of those uh, sensors look like um, conventional antennas that we have spread around in an array across the field. Um, and then some of the sensors that we have for lower frequency signals are really big, heavy coils of wire that are maybe six feet long and weigh uh, 10 or 20 pounds each and those are usually lying on the ground and all of those generate different signals from these different frequencies that lightning okay. emits. And they're all working together to, to produce whatever you've got. Going yeah, exa there. exactly. The, and uh, you know, there's it's sort of an interesting aspect of this that the, the highest frequencies uh, that don't travel very far. So sometimes we're picking up like with our array of antennas, we're trying to, to image pictures of lightning that's very close to the sensors, maybe 10 to 20 miles away at most. Oh. But with some of our really low frequency sensors, these long coils that sit on the ground, lightning is actually powerful enough that if you know when to look, you can pick up a signal from on those sensors from a particular lightning flash that happened honestly 10,000 miles away. Oh, wow. If it was powerful enough. Whoa. So some of our sensors have a global reach and then some of them are for very local imaging. That's incredible. I, it made me think of all the, um, the weather app on my phone and how I get the lightning uh, notifications all the time. And I've been wondering how close are their sensors that they, they can tell that I'm getting a lightning flash wherever I am. Right. I don't have a sensor in my neighborhood. So I've been wondering. Right. They, they don't have to be that close because lightning is such a powerful radio emitter in these very, very short, intense bursts. Those lightning sensing networks tend to have sensors that are spaced sort of across the US, uh, maybe like 500 miles in between them. Oh, wow. Um, and, and any one lightning stroke is, an, is powerful enough that it's usually, I mean, more than five, sometimes 10 or 15 sensors all pick up that signal and then they use the, the arrival time of the radio pulse at each one of those sensors to back out where, it must, where the lightning must have been. That's cool. 
Very cool. Okay, well, the last pre-formatted question is, why is your research important in your field or to the general public and or to the general public? Right, right. Well, um, a couple of things that I like to, to point out here. One is that is the reality of Lightning is that it is actually big business um, in terms of damage to infrastructure and insurance and sort of impact on operations of things like, you know, air travel. Uh, it's billions of dollars a year of impact uh, just inside the United States. Mm. Um, and, uh, and it's really complicated and as a physical process. And if we can understand better what lightning does, um, we can do a better job of mitigating that impact. You know, think about, for example, um, when you are flying and there's a thunderstorm nearby and you're on the ground in the airport, if there is a lightning stroke within a certain distance of the airport, and I don't know exactly what that distance is, maybe like five miles or something, but the moment that happens, uh, you have, have to clear the ground and it's 30 minutes before things can get going outside again on, right. the, on the airport grounds. And why 30 minutes? That's our best guess about what is going to be safe for the ground operations crew. But some storms are different than others, and that may be just one and only one lightning stroke. And maybe the storm is then done, and with a better understanding of how to, of, of lightning and thunderstorms, that impact could be lessened. And I'm sure, I'm just, just thinking, I'm sure you want to get kids back in the pool quicker. <laughs> as as a parent, believe me, I do. Um, yeah. And then the, the the other facet is that I think lightning is pretty cool. Uh, everybody, almost everybody, has some experience with it, and it is super impressive, and it does some amazing things um, that have been discovered even within the last twenty years or so, and being able to be a researcher in that space where we're teasing out some of these new and interesting things that Lightning does. Uh, I really, really like that. Cool. And, and just one thing before we get to some other questions, I noticed you said the word stroke rather than strike. Is there a difference? Is mm, right. No, it just, it, nope. But um, uh, just sort of in the scientific literature, we typically try to use the word lightning stroke for one lightning attachment to the ground. Gotcha. Okay, so let's get to some of our user questions that were submitted via social media. And um, we asked some of our citizen scientists who are um, currently grounded uh, and not doing our, our HERP citizen science program. And Steve, you're part of the HERP citizen science uh, program too, and we're sorry you're not out there, but I, you told me you were, and we'll, we'll get back out there. You've been finding herps on your own. <laughs> this is the time of the year, yeah, so yeah. plenty of lizards, plus plenty of skinks, plenty of toads. Okay, well, one of our first questions I thought would be a good place to start was, is how, do light, how does lightning make thunder? And, and a follow-up that someone else had was, is the practical advice of, of counting five to seven seconds, um, is that to tell the distance of a, a, a lightning from you? Is that real good advice? Um, so how does lightning make thunder? Yes. Um, so uh, a lightning channel is, is made up of super hot gas, and that channel is, as, it, as the lightning channel is traveling from the cloud down to the ground, that channel is really thin, maybe only a, a centimeter, but it's super hot, so hot that the electrons have been stripped off of most of the, the gas, the air. Um, and so it's basically a channel that's making its own wire on its way down to ground. Then when it contacts the ground, there is a tremendous rush of electric current, um, tens of thousands of amperes of electric current that flow through that channel. And that heats the gas even faster and heats it over a time that's um, you know, less than a thousandth of a second. And so when it heats, it expands. And that expansion then pushes on the air and creates a vibrational wave in the air, which is what we hear as sound and thunder. Oh, that makes sense. So, so it's, it's almost like there's a, 
uh, there's a, a channel that's burned first and then the, the energy goes through it at a, at a you know, high voltage. Yep, that, yep, that's exactly it. And then the channel there. expands. Cool. So uh, then to the, the practical wisdom of counting seven seconds yeah. after you hear thunder. Um, yeah, yeah, no, that, that's, that, is, that, is, that is exactly right. And what it is, of course, is that it's the, the wave speed difference between light and sound. Light is exceedingly fast. We can, you know, pretty much think of it as instantaneous. Um, and so as soon as the lightning happens, you see the flash of light, but the speed of sound is only around 700 miles an hour. So it actually takes a little bit of time for that sound to be able to make it to you. Right. And it does turn out that the speed of sound in sort of practical units is about one mile every five seconds. By every five so, seconds. Right. So that time delay count up uh, how many fives, five second blocks you have. And that is exactly how far away that lightning stroke was. Whoa. Well, you mentioned um, uh, cloud to ground lightning uh, and, and someone submitted a question that said, which is more common cloud to cloud lightning or cloud to ground lightning? Um, there were a couple questions about just seeing lightning happening in the sky and people were, were curious about, you know, someone submitted a follow-up to that that says, uh, are there characteristics of a storm that make one or the other cloud to cloud or cloud to ground more likely? Is there characteristics of terrain that does that as well? Yeah, those were all actually some pretty good questions. Um, so like across the entire globe, uh, cloud to cloud or in cloud lightning, is actually way more common than lightning that produces strokes that go from cloud to ground, which we call cloud to ground lightning, um, by almost like nine to one. Like I think 90% of lightning flashes that happen don't actually produce a channel that comes and contacts ground. It stays inside the cloud. Um, and actually, there, I think you asked here, or maybe I saw it in the, in the read ahead, somebody asked about like lightning where that flashes everywhere versus lightning that you can right. see a channel. Um, and it's when, um, it's when there are, so lightning channels are, are both in the cloud and out of the cloud. When they're outside the cloud, you can see them and they're super bright, but when they're inside the cloud, all of the uh, all the little tiny water droplets inside the cloud scatter that light everywhere, and the whole cloud seems to light up because of the way the light uh, is then bounces and gets spread out. Um, so when you see a cloud light up, but you don't see any channels outside the cloud, that's telling you there was a lightning flash, but it was confined to be somewhere inside the cloud. Now, Steve, is that what we call heat lightning generally? Is that um, that is what some people call heat lightning? I, I, I'm, only, I'm only sort of punting on that because I actually grew up in California where we have almost no lightning, so I really didn't grow up having terms for things oh, like, like that's that. Um, but yes, and I, some people do. I didn't grow up calling it heat lightning, but I know some people do. Gotcha. Yeah, that's exactly okay. what that is. I, I guess they call it heat lightning because it's in the summer and it happens when it's hot, which forms those big clouds, which make lightning. And right, and a, a lot, a lot of times, what you see is heat lightning is actually because because it's inside the cloud, so it's kind of high, which means you can see it pretty far away. Mm -hmm. um, and lightning has to be within maybe five or six miles for you to be able to hear the thunder normally. If it's farther away than that, it's the thunder is too faint to hear. So when lightning is 10 miles away inside the cloud, like heat lightning or in cloud lightning, you can see the cloud lighting up and flashing, but it's too far away to hear the thunder. Yep. And, and it, that doesn't mean that it's silent lightning. Lightning always produces thunder. It has to. It's just sometimes it can be far enough away you can't hear it, but you can still see it. And I'll just do one follow up on that: is if if the if the stroke does not leave the cloud, is it generally a less powerful um, electric charge, or is that is that 
No, no, I wouldn't say so. And, and that gets back to the question, I think, of, of like, how does a storm decide whether it's going to produce lightning that comes to the ground or that stays inside the cloud? Um, and what it actually has to do with is the structure of the electric charge layers inside the cloud. Hmm. Um, you know, okay. fundamentally how thunderstorms are made is by friction between water and ice drops inside the cloud. Um, and like when you scuff your feet on a, on a carpet and build up static charge, same thing happens with water and ice particles. When they collide, they exchange electric charge like frictionally and they become charged. And then if you have wind, which you always do in thunderstorms, that can blow lighter particles higher, whereas heavier particles stay lower, and that can then separate a lot of electric charge. Wow. And so where those charge layers are inside the cloud is what controls whether lightning starts in a place that's gonna let it go to ground or whether it's gonna be stuck inside the cloud. Cool, very cool. This is all so cool. <laughs> all right, let's see. Um, well, this was a question I think you answered, can lightning go sideways, which you answered it stays within a cloud essentially, but if it's, if it's going to leave the cloud, right? go sideways, it's probably going to search for the ground, right? Uh, sometimes, but you know, it doesn't always. And sometimes lightning does these crazy things where it will go sideways for like five miles oh. and then turn and touch the ground. And that's, okay. that's something uh, both colloquially and in science we call a bolt from the blue, which is super dangerous lightning because you can get lightning coming and contacting the ground where the storm that it's connected to is far enough away that you didn't even really know it was there. Wow. So, so get out of the pool, kids. Like, do not <laughs> stay in the pool. What are seriously. you doing? So, so lightning, yeah, it, it can go a lot of different directions and it's a little bit random what it decides to do. I sort of think of it like, you, you know, lightning in some ways is like you grab a piece of paper and you start pulling on it and you're like stressing the paper. Mm -hmm. That's a little bit like building up an electric field in air. If you put enough stress on it, it'll start to tear. And electrically that tear is lightning, but of course in a piece of paper, it just tears. But what the shape of the tear is, you do 10 pieces of paper like that, it'll be 10 different ones. And it's huh. essentially random based on exactly how you were pulling it and where the fibers were on the paper. Lightning's kind of the same. Steve, that's perfect. It's my, my next question, someone asked, why is lightning dendritic? And meaning, and why does it split off and not stay in one line? I think you're answering that right now. Yeah, so from our perspective, it, it is a little bit random. Like where lightning decides to go depends on little tiny micro scale features of air and, and dust inside the air and exactly what this channel encounters. And so in a lot of ways, it's very unpredictable. Speaking of unpredictable things, I know you study a uh, phenomenon that is not just regular lightning that we're used to. And someone asked, do we experience neat things like sprites and ball lightning here in Durham? And uh, first wondering what those two phenomena are. Uh, okay, let me start with ball lightning because I can do that one I think a little bit faster. Um, ball lightning is this amazing thing that nobody's completely sure if it's real or not because it's never been reliably observed and documented scientifically. Wow. But people have seen it. Um, and if you read the reports, it's sometimes after, uh, sometimes just in a thunderstorm and sometimes after a lightning flash, there are these sort of glowing balls that can persist for a long time and sort of float around and then disappear 30 seconds later. Um, I think the, when, when I talk to colleagues about this and like, you know, at the bar during a conference, hey, do you think ball lightning's real? I think the consensus is that it probably is because there are enough reputable like written reports and descriptions of people who have, by people who have seen it, 
and describe it and there's consistency across those. Have you seen it? Nope, definitely have not seen it. Um, and nobody's really reproduced it in a lab and nobody's really like captured it on video scientifically. Cool. So I think the best guess is like lightning is so energetic that every once in a while really weird things can happen that we don't completely understand and ball lightning is one of those things that's really uncommon. Cool. But now sprites, right. that is a, that's a real thing. Um, but, and maybe just as spectacular. This is one of those things that had been anecdotally described by people who thought they saw something unusual above thunderstorms um, for like a hundred years. And, and not surprisingly, airline pilots, and airplane pilots had seen it fairly routinely because they spend a lot of time above thunderstorms, um, but they didn't like to report it because there would be concern that they were seeing things. If they oh, were yeah, seeing sure. Mysterious flashes in places where we knew scientifically there shouldn't be. But it turns out there are that when you have a really, really big lightning flash, it can, going back to my piece of paper analogy, when you have a really big lightning flash between the cloud and ground that very quickly moves a lot of electric charge from the cloud to the ground, you can create this sort of secondary electrical stress for that would promote creating sparks and lightning at really high altitudes, 40 to 50 miles above the thunderstorm. Ooh, very high. And if there's a big enough lightning flash, you then create these super long secondary sparks that we call sprites um above the thunderstorm and these things can go from like extend from maybe 50 miles at the top to 20 miles at the bottom above ground level and they're just as wide so they're like 30 miles by 30 miles by 30 miles um in size and but they're not easy to see because if you, if they're happening if they're being produced by a thunderstorm that's on top of you you have no hope of seeing it Oh, sure. You'll only see it when a thunderstorm is like 150 or 200 or 300 miles away that's below the horizon, but you can see above it. You can clearly see the sky above the thunderstorm. And then the other trick is they're very quick. They mm -hmm. last maybe a thousandth of a second, one millisecond. So if you saw it with your naked eye, you would have seen this ever so brief flash that you probably wouldn't even be sure, did I just see something or was that something else if you didn't know what you were looking for? Um, but in the past, it's funny, in the past 25 years, um, research equipment has gotten better and better and now we have very sensitive, very high speed cameras that we can use to capture these and put them basically on slow motion video where we can resolve what happens and, uh, and they're amazing. What do they what do they look like? We don't have a picture, but can you describe it? Um, I can. Like the really, really big ones look a little bit like jellyfish, where there's sort of at the top, there's kind of a diffuse blob, and then coming down, there are all these discrete lightning-like channels. Cool. Um, and and they are mostly red if you, if you can cool. record it on a color camera. So if you ever saw one, were lucky enough to see one, it would be kind of like this blood red flash in the sky that looked really big, but really short. Wow. And, and so the, the, then the question was, do those happen in Durham? Uh, definitely. We've recorded a lot of those things from our Duke Forest site when we've had cameras running that can capture them. Oh, cool. Oh, we got to see those sometime. We'll put them on our social media feed uh, so at some point. Um, I, Steve, we're getting close to the end of our time, and, and I'm really thankful so, that you've, you've taken all this time with us. I think we'll just ask a couple more questions, and we'll just call this the lightning round. And, um, <laughs> okay, just, sounds good. I've been wanting to use that joke ever since we decided to. <laughs> so, I'm glad uh, you got a chance to squeeze it in. Yeah. So just just uh, in a in a word or two, um, you could you could answer this uh, these next two questions. Um, 
given the tremendous energy of lightning released uh, in from a single flash uh, from a thunderstorm, do you ever see humans being able to harness this energy to use in sustaining our world by replacing fossil fuels or the resultant pollution <laughs> the global problems they create? Remember, just a quick answer to that. Well, sadly, the quick answer is definitively no. Oh. <laughs> And, and you know, but I, I can't, I have to explain why, because okay. that's a totally compelling and reasonable question. Lightning is super high energy. Why can't we like harvest all this energy? Sure. Uh, the problem is there's two problems. I'll just focus on the main problem. The, the main problem is, is this, it is too geographically spread out for us to be able to meaningfully capture and it also seems like that it happens a lot, but it is so brief that the amount of power it actually delivers, basically it's this, suppose we somehow had the ability to collect the energy being deposited on the ground over all of the United States from lightning, which we absolutely never would because we'd have to put, to do that, we'd have to put gigantic towers spaced like every half mile across the entire US. So the cost would just be insane. But even if you did that to capture all that lightning, basically what you could do with that energy is like every household in the United States would get enough energy over one year to run a 100 watt light bulb for about a week. Oh, wow. Um, so it's just, it's not enough total energy to be able to do very much. That's crazy. It's that, yeah. And, and, and you're right, and it does seem like we should because it is, it, it's so, uh, the, the amount of power in lightning is so high, but it is so short yeah. that when you soak up all that energy and then deliver it more slowly into devices that we run, it's just not that much. Yeah, and we all know we can't, we don't have batteries that can, charge that fast, our phones take forever. That's so. the other aspect. It's like trying to fill a glass of water from a fire hose that pulses on for a fraction of a second. Like you can't even, right. you can't even get that into your cup in the first place. Well, we'll just end with this one question, Steve, that's pretty practical for people maybe who are visiting the forest or anywhere else. Um, right. Does doing anything while in a tree covered forest actually protect you from lightning? We were always told to squat on our camp mats, uh, wooden trees get hit first. Uh, just general lightning protection advice. Um, you know, maybe yeah. do you run to your car? Do you hug a tree? What do you do? <laughs> Definitely do not hug a tree. Okay, that's good. I mean, hug a tree, but not when there's a thunderstorm. That's right. Um, run to your car is by far the best thing if you can do that. Like get yourself to covered shelter. And, and a car would do it because you have the sort of metal frame enclosing you. Um, the, you know, the problem is, yes, lightning will strike a tree first if you're in the forest, but lightning in some ways is like a wild animal. Like it, where it decides to go after it strikes something is totally unpredictable. And lightning will hit a tree, but then lightning will shoot out of one of the branches oh. and go somewhere else to another tree. Actually, I have a colleague at Duke faculty whose house burned down because lightning struck a tree in the backyard and then jumped over from the tree to her house. Oh wow! And lit a fire in the attic that got too big before. So, so that's that's the thing you're trying to avoid in forests and with trees. I mean, yes, the lightning is going to strike the tree, but if you're close to the tree that the lightning struck you're at serious risk for actually getting struck by some secondary channel that comes off of the tree. Ah. So your best bet is, your best bet is always get to shelter as fast as you can, if that's an option. And, and my old Boy Scout uh, training is coming to mind. Is there, is there something to the old um, advice to pull your heels together real quick? I, I don't remember. Was that, if, if lightning hits near you? Or does it not matter at that point if lightning hits near you? Well, um, right, like like bring your feet together so you only have one contact point on the ground. Uh, I think it was more about 
I think it was contact point, but it, it was something about how lightning arcs. And I never believed this because if lightning goes into you, I don't know what good this is going to do. But supposedly, it could, if it goes in one foot, it could go out the other, I think was. The oh, okay, old. actually, so there sort of is something to that. Like, oh. but um, if you hear the lightning, if you hear thunder, then whatever uh, electric current has ha already happened. So oh, you're never going to be able to do that quickly enough. But this is sort of interesting. You may, people may have seen the occasional report of like dozens of dead livestock animals from a lightning storm in a field. All oh, right. Yeah. And, and how did that happen? So how that happens is lightning doesn't have to strike all of those animals. When lightning strikes the ground, it then sends electric current out through the ground. And if you are, or an animal, like an animal does, contacting the ground in two points that are separated and the electric current is going like this, some of it will go be shunted through you because ah, your feet are separated. That's what it was, yeah. But if you stand with your feet together, there's no loop for the current to enter you and leave you. And so by having, so if the cows or sheep could stand with all four hooves in one small spot, they would be safer. I got you. So That's there, there is, that was, there is that was. a lightning protection stance where like you bring your feet together and you get as low as possible. Um, I think my lightning good. protection stance is gonna to be to run to my car. Yes, help. if you can run to your car, that is your best bet. Well, Steve, we really, really appreciate you taking all this time to talk to us about all the cool stuff that you study and, and sharing your, your expertise. If, Thanks, uh, Blake. It was, it was a lot of fun. Oh, sure. I'm, I'm so glad. If people want to find out more about your work, uh, how can they do that? And are there cool resources or websites you'd like to share with anybody? Yeah, that's a, that was actually the thorniest question. So my research, my Duke research website does have some resources uh, and and uh, things to look at. Not as many as I should have there. Um, but you know what? The answer is, I've made me realize that I wish there was like a good scientifically curated site of like to answer lightning, like lightning FAQ, basically. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't know that there is. So this has planted the seed, you know, with all this spare time that, that many of us have is get some of my colleagues together. We should sit down and like make a list of some of those frequently asked questions that we get and just like put it out there. Yeah, there's a lot of um, regional knowledge about lightning that is not necessarily. Yeah, that uh, too, exactly. Uh, yeah, so I would just, uh, tell everyone to go to an image search online and look up pictures of sprites. They are really beautiful. And um, that would be the resource I would share because I, I happen to know that, that. That's a great, great starting point to find some spectacular images that will probably spur some questions. Yep, great. Well, thank you everyone. Thank you, Steve. Um, this has been our first video in a series, again, called Ask a Scientist. If you learned something from this video, let us know in the comments below or email us at dukeforest at duke.edu. And stay tuned to what we're doing on the Duke Forest Teaching and Research Laboratory by signing up for our newsletter and by following us on social media. Um, until next time, have a nice day and may the forest be with you. All right. Bye. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Blake. Bye.